Coming up on Star Talk, our guest is Dr. Nick Tiller. He's an exercise physiologist, and we talk about the use of off label drug prescriptions like Ozempic and other life changing downstream benefits they might hold. In that case, it's weight loss, but might it also curb addiction of any kind? Is there such a thing as a quick fix? All that and more coming up on Star Talk. This is Star Talk. Neil deGrasse Tyson here, your personal astrophysicist. And this is Special Edition, where we're going to be talking about medical quick fixes. I got with me my two co hosts, Gary, Gary O'Reilly. How you doing, man? I'm good, Neil. All right. Good to be on. Former soccer pro and sports commentator mm -hmm. uh, professionally. And we, we, they lend him to us for this purpose, gives us street <laughs> cred anytime we think about human physiology and sports of course we got chuck nice chuck how you doing man hey buddy what's happening long time co-host and yes. your comedian and actor all right so gary you and your producers like think this stuff up so clue me in what today is about um in a previous episode we explored quick fix solutions in the health and wellness industry scotch and yes scotch fixes everything boom yeah, there and, you go buddy and uh, we're not we're not and talking we're, tape and we're out Quick fix, Scotch, for everything in life. No. <laughs> okay, that and 420. Um, so the this hit. show basically was a must-do because right now the quickest fixes in town are weight loss drugs, uh, Ozempic and Wigovi, depending on your preference. So that's our point of entry. And from there, we'll go off-label on a journey that I think we'll find pretty interesting. And today's guest is, it's fair to say, a skeptic. He's been on before. So, Neil, introduce our guest, please. Oh, so Dr. Nick Tiller, who's yeah. it's his second time on Star Talk. A think. returning champion. Re returning <laughs> champion. A repeat offender, you could say. Oh, oh. there you go. And, and, <laughs> Recidivist. And I I discovered you. I mean, not discovered you, but I, for myself, I, mm -hmm. I realized you existed upon seeing the cover of your book, The Skeptic's Guide to Sports Science. Because I know there's so much woo-woo and and pseudoscience circulating in that community and i said we got to get this guy on the show so you had, you had him at skeptic <laughs> the moment he saw a skeptic on the yeah, cover, what, i don't care what you're skeptic of you're, you're your, like, oh. that was a try i used that word very very precisely i knew what i was doing when i when i titled it that yeah for sure you've got it so you 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 have a phd in respiratory functions of human physiology your senior research fellow in exercise physiology at Harbor UCLA Medical Center, very cool. Leading authority on physiology and pathophysiology. Love that. An extreme exercise, being an ultra marathoner and triathlon yourself. Ooh. You would call that extreme exercise for sure. You're a columnist also for Skeptical Inquirer magazine, my single favorite magazine in the world. Let the record show. Ooh. Yes. Ooh. Every Praise month, indeed. I, I wait for it to show up and it's a how are people misthinking things today? <laughs> and there it is, and, the, and they show it. So, so Nick, welcome back to Star Talk. It's great to see you guys again. Thanks for having me back. So, Nick, let's just let's just go straight out. All right, I every day I find myself reciting the jingle for Ozempic. Okay. Oh, 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 oh God! Oh, Can you imagine? Oh, oh. <laughs> So could you All imagine right. if it was Wigovi and they started with we, we, we? It just wouldn't be as good, would it? It wouldn't be as good. wouldn't be as good, would it? Let me tell you, I have a 10-year-old daughter, and for the last two years now, she walks up to me, and, I, and it still gets me, and she goes, knock, knock. I say, who's there? She goes, oh. I say, oh, who? And she goes, oh, 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 oh. oh. And I'm like, really? That's good marketing, huh? I, I was like, damn, they, you were watching too much TV, girl. Well, plus, I, I expected better for her as the daughter of a comedian. Just thought maybe. I'd put it out there. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe I'm not that good of a comedian. <laughs> Let's start a fight. <laughs> so, so Nick, we've heard a lot about this. I knew it had some uh, relevance to, to uh, diabetes, right, for diabetes patients. And then people started losing weight, losing their cravings, and... I know people, that's an expensive drug, and I know some rich people, and apparently this is just in their regimen, their weekly regimen. So it feels like a wonder drug, another quick fix. So how do we go from type 
to diabetes to a weight loss drug. How does that happen? Well, I, I guess Ozempic was FDA approved. So any drug that, become, that comes onto the market has to be approved by the Food, Food and Drug Administration. Uh, so the FDA approved this in 2017 as a treatment for type 2 diabetes. So type 2 diabetes is when people produce insulin from the pancreas, but the insulin, they're insulin resistant. So the insulin that they're producing is not exerting its effects on the body. And of course, insulin's function is to extract glucose from the blood to keep blood glucose levels within a very narrow homeostatic range. And glucose is synonymous in that example with energy driving your body needs, correct? Right, mm. right absolutely. A glucose is just a simple carbohydrate. So mm -hmm. any type of carbohydrate generally will cause your blood sugar levels to rise right, to yeah. some extent. So it's, one, blood... it's one of that, that family of oses, right? There's sucrose, fructose, uh, glucose. Mm -hmm. So they're all sugars, mm, yeah. right? Yeah, They're all sugars. Glucose is the simplest form of sugar. It's a single molecule. Uh, fructose is another one. It's a single molecule. Yeah. Sucrose, what we call table sugar, is uh, is a disaccharide. So it's it's glucose and fructose bound together. But it, it essentially, they all get absorbed through the intestine, enter the blood, and they're, they're going to cause a rise in blood glucose. People with diabetes can't control their blood sugar because of the reason that I just mentioned, that they're either not producing enough insulin. Mm -hmm. That would in be type, type one. one. That's type That's, one. Okay. In type two diabetes, they're producing it, but it's not but it's not potent enough. It's not exerting its effect. If your blood sugar gets too high, it can cause systemic inflammation and all sorts of other problems. And if your blood sugar falls too low, it's difficult to stay conscious generally. So <laughs> your body, <laughs> your body will try. Your body will try to maintain. Know if my glucose is too level, yeah, you, you won't. You don't know because you're unconscious, right? Yeah, well, yeah. Whoever's in the room with you will know because you'll be lying horizontal <laughs> yeah. on the floor. Okay. So your body will do whatever it can to maintain your blood sugar levels within this kind of narrow, normal, this homeostatic range. So this drug that uh, that we call Zempic, it's called it's called a GLP one agonist. And GLP-1 is glucagon-like peptide 1, has a very important role in the body that when we take in some food, particularly if the food contains fats and sugars, right. it will stimulate the release of GLP-1, which acts on the pancreas, which then stimulate, which then releases insulin. Is there a term for the drug? Is it, I mean, we're calling them GLP-1s. So, so the drug itself is called semaglutide, and the brand name is Ozempic. So that's what's actually branded oh. and then mm. FDA approved to treat type 2 diabetes. But shortly after these drugs were being prescribed to people with type 2 diabetes, physicians and scientists found that one of the side, I mean, you can call it a side effect or an additional effect, was that people were losing weight as well, which right. is generally good because people with type 2 diabetes are often overweight, or if you're obese, if you're clinically obese, it predisposes you to type 2 diabetes. And so after a couple of years, the, the drug was prescribed by physicians off-label, which I guess we're going to talk about in a little while, mm. to help people with weight loss. And then in 2021, the FDA reapproved semaglutide under a different brand name, Wegovi, specifically uh, to help people to lose weight. But it works via this, the same kind of mechanism. It seems to me there's an interesting backdoor here that you're describing, because if FDA approves a drug for whatever reason, and you find another application for that drug, it doesn't have to be FDA approved again. Is that correct? That's correct. Well, as, long and... as, your, as long as your doses are within the range of the originally intended dose, it doesn't have to be tested. That's why everybody loves the little blue pill. <laughs> You're right. Well, and that was that's an interesting one, actually, because <laughs> because well that that was when that was originally discovered it, it, it's um i've got i've written down some of the drug names here sildenafil citrate because i can't remember the drug name but sildenafil citrate was discovered because researchers were looking at ways to lower blood pressure right and they mm -hmm. found that this blood pressure lowering drug had this unintended side effect that it increased blood flow to the male genitalia right. so they rebranded it as viagra and the and the weird thing is they now prescribed Viagra off-label to treat high blood pressure. That's no, right. It's, <laughs> That's right. It's gone full circle. It's, it's gone full circle. So what is it about carrying extra weight, specifically subcutaneous belly fat, that leads to diabetes? What is that association? I never knew the happen? answer to that myself. So yeah, yeah what's what, going what on there? It, what is going on there? Right. So belly fat is more metabolically active and it's closer to your viscera, to the internal organs. 
So if you have a large amount of belly fat, it's more likely to penetrate deep into the, into the viscera and, so, and surround your pancreas and your, and your liver and so forth. Ooh. So because this fat is more metabolically active, it, is, it has a, a much more a much closer association with disrupted blood, blood, blood sugar control and signaling. So, and this is a problem for men especially because I don't know if you've noticed this, but men tend to store more of their body fat around the midsection. Oh, right. yeah. Women in general tend to store more of their body fat around the hips and bums. Wow, well, they get—they're so lucky. <laughs> well, and in in effect, they are because it's the it's the fat, it's the visceral fat, the central adiposity, which predisposes, as you say, to type two diabetes. So diabetes. that means men are more prone to type two diabetes than women, based on this analysis. Men who have greater uh, waist to hip ratios, yeah. yeah. Right, right, right. So, or smaller so, so Chuck, we need a Sir mix -a -Lot to do a song about <laughs> men's belly fat. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I like big guts in a cannot <laughs> lie. <laughs> All right. So, Nick, um, <laughs> when patients being treated for type 2 diabetes with the I call it semaglutide, but semaglutide, it's a tomato, it's a tomato, whatever. That's because you're English. I know, sorry. Uh, but I don't apologize for that. The thing is... You just did. <laughs> I take it back. I take it back. <laughs> this is not the apology you're looking for. <laughs> so, so looking at that and saying to you, is there enough clinical evidence to back up this downstream off labeling of this drug as, uh, as, as another use? Or is it, you know, was it enough of, you know, what, doc, I lost weight. Fabulous. Great. Uh, or is it just got to go clinically how do you how do you process this for this drug to come again as a, in, in another way yeah so the, the only similarities between the two approval processes is that semaglutide semaglutide has already gone through mm. the phase one and two trials which are essentially right. about uh, making sure that, that, that uh, administering the thing is not going to cause toxic downstream effects so the safety profile is kind of already sort of in place but they'll they'll study it independently for the independent effects and there are dozens and dozens of very very good randomized controlled trials that have looked at this independently in terms of treating type 2 diabetes because it helps control blood glucose and independently using semaglutide for weight loss because it is a slightly, uh, I guess you could, could say it's a slightly different mechanism. So, so you have GLP-1. It has a bunch of different right. effects on the body. Wherever there's a concentration of GLP-1 receptors, then GLP-1 is going to exert its effect. So the, the first place that we have receptors is obviously in the pancreas that we've just discussed. So GLP-1 helps to upregulate the, the uh, secretion of insulin, and it helps the beta cells of the pancreas, which actually does the secreting of insulin, to proliferate, and it sort of in, they increase in number. Mm. So it can actually help to treat type 2 diabetes in that way. But we know that GLP-1 also acts on the stomach, and it does so in a way that, suppresses the amount of gastric acid that's being secreted into the stomach. So obviously when you, when you take in food, you swallow the food down into the stomach, it comes into, co into contact with these uh, different lipases and different enzymes to break down the food and hydrochloric acid, and it turns the food into a, into a mushy sludge and it then empties into the small intestine. Uh -huh. And GLP-1 actually- Evidence is that, just look at anyone's throw up. Yes. <laughs> right. Exactly. It turns it into that stuff. Yeah. And but but it but it does so in a way that it it suppresses the amount of gastric acid that's secreted. So it takes longer to break down the food, and it slows the rate of gastric emptying. So you essentially stay fuller for longer. Wow. Mechanically, you keep more food in your stomach. So it's helped to suppress appetite in that way. But there's a, there's one other mechanism that's really important that we have to mention, and that GLP one also act on receptors in the brain. So yeah. the hypothalamus is the, is the body's kind of appetite control center. Right. And yes. by stimulating GLP-1 receptors in the hypothalamus, then we can actually reduce appetite, right. increase feelings of satiety, and people want to eat less. So is it true or is this correlation rather than causation that it not only reduces appetite for food, it reduces the other cravings and appetites, including alcohol and, you know, like sugar cravings. and it's Suppressing things. urges. Urges. Ur yeah. urges. Very good. Thank you. Is that it, where the brain part of this comes in? It's probably not just correlation. It probably is causation. The reason that I say probably is because this all started because uh, 
patients who were prescribed semaglutide for one reason or another mm -hmm. were coming back to their doctors saying, it's, you know, it's not just that I want to eat less food, but my cravings and my typical addictions like alcohol or even cigarette smoking uh, have, have also been suppressed. Yeah. So, so then we started to look at this under controlled conditions. There have been a bunch of studies now, mostly in rodent models, so in uh, rats and mice, and a couple of studies in non-human primates. And what we think is happening, the mechanism hasn't been fully unpacked, but what we think is happening is that uh, that GLP-1 acts to downregulate dopamine transmission in mm. the brain. Wow. And dopamine, as we know, has a By really way, we central We have an entire role. episode on dopamine, so yep. people want to look into our archives, it, it's absolutely. there. Absolutely. Yeah. And, 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 and when, we, when we eat some kind of food, if it, particularly if it's tasty food, if it contains lots of fat and sugar, the stuff that tastes really good, right? We get a dopamine spike in the brain that makes mm. us, it gives us kind of a, a nice sensation. It, it, it reinforces food-related urges and, and uh, reward-seeking mechanisms. And by down-regulating that pathway, then GLP-1 can, in theory, help to, to, to improve impulse control and decrease reward-seeking behavior. And that would be for whatever stimulates dopamine. So, so, so Nick, I have some friends who are foodies, but like high-level, high-profile foodies seeking out the finest chefs in the finest restaurants. Those who went on Ozempic, they noticed not only did they eat less, but they were deriving less enjoyment mm. from the food. This isn't it's James brain, Beard isn't. worthy. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it was a double effect. It's like, yeah, right. not yeah. only am I not really hungry, I don't even want it. And so some of them were worried that it was subtracting away from them this, this big part of their social life, going out and enjoying fine foodie type things prepared by, by high profile chefs. You call it's, this a Michelin star meal? <laughs> <laughs> they need a tandem Ozempic rating of, this, of the meal. <laughs> right. It's one of those repercussions that you don't even think about. But, but yeah, I guess we, we have to frame this in the context that there are, there, there are two types of feedings. There's what we call homeostatic feeding. And then there's uh, hedonic or hedonic feeding. Mm -hmm. And they kind of, they're self-explanatory, but homeostatic feeding is when we eat because we, you know, we, we haven't had enough calories. You've got to survive. Uh, you've got to survive, right? Eat to if, live, not living to eat. If you go out and do a, you know, a hard training session or you haven't eaten for a number of hours, then you're going to have a negative calorie deficit. You're going to have a calorie deficit. So your body's going to tell you to go and eat more. And that's and called homeostatic. Homeostatic feeding, exactly. Yes, Just to, in an effort to maintain normal yeah. Dynamic equilibrium. By the way, the way you but, word that sounds like we're zoo animals. Okay, it's I your like feeding. <laughs> in, in a way, feeding. Yeah. <laughs> let's Kinda not funny. tug at that thread. Huh? And so, and so, hedonic feeding is literally is uh, is is chasing that reward. It's that reward seeking behavior, food that makes us feel good, yeah. and that explains yeah. how we can go and have a huge Thanksgiving meal, have a big full stomach, and still find our, ourselves going back to get a second helping, second pumpkin helping. pie or dessert. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We don't need pumpkin the calories, pie. but we like the feeling. Right. Mm. So, so if the feeling doesn't drive the dopamine, you're not even going to have the thought. Right, exactly. And and that's how this that's how GLP-1 in theory uh, by down regulating that process. And that's why, you know, if we were only if we only obeyed the homeostatic feeding triggers, right. we, most people would probably be normal weight because we, right. we would eat to I mean, look like everybody in the 1970s. And I know <laughs> Gary, I know you want to get in here, but since yeah, we're sure. on this right here, yeah, just yeah. right here, I want to stay right here for one second. Wouldn't it make sense then that neurochemically, if we were to just deprive ourselves these kind of um, pleasure triggers, that our brain would naturally kind of go into a state where it doesn't care, like we wouldn't be seeking the rewards. So you cut out sugar for like two weeks, right, and just stay off of it. Like your body will say, all right, F it. I don't want sugar anymore, you know? Are you, are you asking him a question or are you declaring I'm asking, it? I'm asking. Well, I, I think, I think that was, it's not. That was my impression of my body, but okay, that's, yeah, I'm asking yeah. the question. Well, I think it's intuitive, but if you, if you ask anybody who's ever followed a fad diet, they can probably cut out all kinds of junk food and confectionery and alcohol for six weeks, two months. You know, for, they can go for a long time without that, and eventually they fall off the wagon, right? Uh -huh. this, this kind of characterizes most people's experiences with dieting, which is why dieting never works because as soon as you conceive the idea of a wagon you're going to fall off it right so so chuck's um, answer is no <laughs> probably no there, there, there might be some kind of neurochemical mechanism that i'm not very you know that i don't fully understand but um experience tells me that that's not the case 
Hey, Neil, happy Sweet 16. What? You, this is your 16th book coming out, the one that we started working on oh, together oh. two years ago. This? <laughs> well, thank you. Yes, it's my 16th book. Practically forgot about because I've been very busy, and I guess it's coming out in a month. Well, it's my forget. first book, so. Oh, sorry. We gotta do me. something. Sorry. So I should be more excited that, okay. Absolutely. I may be biased, but I think this is your best one yet. <laughs> so Nick, we've got a neurochemical process here and it works on addiction and therefore dopamine. Are trials underway for this particular drug to work on dementia? And if so, what's the process in play? So most of these additional effects that we're reading about, so it, you know, but supposedly this drug can reduce the risk of dementia and Alzheimer's and polycystic ovary syndrome and all of these other things. Most of that stuff is, this is where I turn into a grumpy old man. Most of that stuff's reported by the mainstream media. And you know, as they tend to do, they misrepresent the mainstream science. So probably there is an, there is an indirect relationship between use of semaglutide and the overall risk for developing dementia in this case, but it's mediated by weight loss. So we know, for wow. example, that people who have type two diabetes have a greater risk for developing dementia and other kinds of cognitive de decline because of this systemic uh, inflammation that occurs because of uncontrolled blood sugar levels, right? right? So if we help type two diabetics to better control their blood sugar, then they in turn, they, they in turn reduce their risk of developing uh, dementia and other types of cognitive dysfunction. So there is a very indirect link there, but it doesn't seem to be a direct mechanism. There, there's some evidence that maybe GLP-1 receptor agonists might help to improve cognition in, in some respects, but it's very early stage research and it's going to be a couple of years before we, before we know any more. So uh, a lot of the time, if, if you can decrease somebody's body weight, help them to better control their blood sugar, then their risk for all sorts of the things. The whole portfolio it comes in. Right. Exactly. With, with well, it, seems to me, it seems to me like we're looking in the wrong, uh, wrong area because from, what, from everything I hear about medically, inflammation is the worst thing that can happen to the body. Right. It's the body's way of saying, look, I got to get rid of some bad stuff. But the reaction to that is what is harmful. Why are we not looking for a way to just stop inflammation? Anti-inflammatories? <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Is it, is it, well, if you think about every, you every major... Chuck quick before he blows a gasket. He's on, I think on the every right major non-communicable disease exerts its kind of... Its pathophysiology is, is due to inflammation. Yeah. So cardiovascular disease... For example, uh, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, yes. cigarette smoking is so bad for you because it exerts systemic it's, inflammation. Right. It's, it's essentially all about, yeah, managing inflammation. inflammation. And we mentioned it even, right at the start. Even high blood pressure, inflammation is it's the big all, yeah, problem. It seems to be inflammation. Even ultra endurance exercise, which is an area that I've become interested in, it's, it's probably not super good for you in, in some respects because it, it, it induces this systemic inflammatory state. So yeah, trying to reduce inflammation, trying to induce stress, uh, physiological and psychological stress seems to be a, a pretty important thing to do. Uh, so, so I have a, I, Neil, I have a double S question here. This, the, the sort of azempic drug, that group of drugs gets released in what, 2017? A, were they designed specifically to have these downstream effects or are we just slow to realize these benefits? Well, there was something called COVID in between there, Gary. Just, <laughs> you know, just let's get real here. But Nick, yes. <laughs> well, I, I, to try and answer your question, I think I don't think we've been slow on the uptake to try and understand. Okay. We've known about GLP-1. So mm. this is naturally produced GLP-1 that's produced from the intestine in response it's to- It's a hormone, isn't it? It's a, it's a peptide hormone that's produced yeah. naturally in the intestine. But, and, and we've known about the functions of GLP-1 for a long, long time, but the human-derived GLP-1 has a very, very short half-life. It's metabolized as a half-life of about 10 minutes. So it, it's secreted from the intestine, and then it's very, very quickly metabolized. Only about 15, 20% of what's produced actually makes it into the blood. Well, just, and, just I have to insert here, because you borrowed the term half-life from physics. So in yeah. case people don't precisely know what half-life means, a half-life is always given with an interval of time, as Nick just did. So if the half-life is 10 minutes, after 10 minutes, half of that chemical remains. Another 10 minutes, half, half of that of half, half remains. 
Another 10 minutes, half of that half. So it's two to that power of having. So if you do this three times, it's two times, two times two is eight. You have one eighth of what's there. So rapidly within an hour, there's, I, I presume there's uh, insignificant amounts in your, in your system, unless it continues to be produced. Right, and and so, and I'm glad you did the math because there's no chance I would have been able to do that. But oh, no. <laughs> but uh, but but but, and actually, that's a very interesting segue because how GLP-1 agonists were first discovered was actually discovered in the 1990s by a government-funded researcher called John Eng, E N G, and he was researching the various constituents of lizard venom. And so, Chuck, what? How's your lizard knowledge? Let me tell you, I love lizards. Yeah. Oh no, I, I'm sorry. That's Lizzo. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's hey, something different altogether. Altogether different. All yeah, different. Yeah. Okay. Well, are you are you familiar with the Hilo monster? Yes, yeah, very much. We call yeah, it a Hilo monster, monster, but yeah, 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 they, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, so so the the uh, the Hilo monster has is as far as I'm aware is North America's only venomous yes, lizard. Lizard, yes. And and so and and, so, and and it was the prehistoric creature of choice in 1950s movies filmed close up making you think it's big and bigger than the people running away from it because it's got that fork tongue sticking out and it flops its legs and it's pretty scary if you've never seen one before and that was our you know before jurassic park and cgi dinosaurs that was the best we could do beautiful well its venom is also quite scary as well and this this character john eng was researching the various constituents that made up the the lizard venom and he found that there was uh, there was a, a a protein in in the venom that had a very very similar molecular structure to what we knew then to be glp1 producing the human intestine but whereas glp1 human glp1 had this very very short half life of 10 minutes or so this lizard venom, this lizard venom protein had a half life of like five hours. So he immediately thought, well, if we could find a way to isolate this and synthesize it, maybe we could administer this, administer this to humans and help with blood glucose control. Fast forward a decade, over a decade, and the FDA finally approved a drug called exenatide, which is based on this lizard venom protein. Whoa. And that was, that, that was our first short acting GLP-1 agonist. And since then, we've, we've developed... Uh, uh, GLP-1 agonists that have longer and longer half-lives, five hours, 10 hours, and then semaglutide has a, has a half-life of between five and seven days. So it's a long-acting GLP-1 wow. agonist, which means it can exert its effect around the oh, clock. Around Hence the clock. Right. So, so, that means, so the, the dose is a once a week dose, if I remember correctly. Right, it's a weekly dose. Which yeah, exenatide was twice a day. That's consistent with that information about the right. longer half life. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And exenatide was twice a day. So people would have to jab themselves twice a day because of the half life, whatever, five hours. And not only is there difficult, you know, it's difficult to get people to adhere to that kind of structure, uh, they also had to time the application around meals, much like they had to do with yeah. insulin, which is a drag for everybody. Whereas right. smacklotide, well, it's a it's one. It's not a drag day. if you would otherwise die. All right. right. Well, I to make that clear. It's yeah. preferable to, to, be, <laughs> yeah. to death. Correct. All right. So, so what, from everything we've been discussing, it does sound like a miracle drug. So, so where, where does your skepticism land in the presence of this drug relative to all the other drugs that have claimed to be miracle cures? Well, I, I've, I've gone back and forth on this and, I, and I've struggled with this quite a lot, actually, because as you, as you kind of allude to, <clears throat> for the last more than a decade of my life, I've been very much an advocate as an exercise scientist and a skeptic of this idea that any health and wellness outcome that is worth achieving has to be work. You have to work for it. You have to you have to put in some time and some effort and some commitment. Says the man takes, who does triathlons. Yes, right, yes. exactly. It takes yeah. time. You can't Where, you can't get these things over. Dude, I want to I want to be in I want to be in the shape that you're in, but I just I don't want to leave the couch. I, I was going to say, Nick, we're <laughs> only seeing you from uh, like a uh, chest up, shoulders up, <laughs> and 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 we're like, yeah, this yeah, guy, this my, guy my does boy a is, lot is of work. Two and a half percent body fat, exactly. Sure. It's, it's, right. it's, it's, a, it's a padded shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I got my my, my, my my storage of semaglutide. That's what you don't realize. We actually were ribbing you about looking good, but we didn't let you finish t- telling us your convictions on Ozempic. Yeah, Mr. Skeptic. Well, as as an exercise scientist, as a skeptic, and for for the longest time, I've always I've always been of the opinion that to achieve any meaningful health and wellness change requires time and effort, right? And particularly that this. Obesity and, and uh, being overweight is probably about as complex as a public health problem can be. 
Everybody wants simple solutions to complex problems. And you can't just say the, run triathlons like I do, and that'll lose your body fat. That's that's not going to work. You, right? you, you can you can in some cases if your exercise volume is so high that you're expending so much energy, then sometimes you know that 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 will be enough to do it. But rarely is that the case. And so, but here we have a drug that is seemingly safe. No drugs are completely safe. There are side effects, which you know maybe maybe we'll circle back to. But uh, it seems to be apparently safe. What one caveat to that is we don't have studies on people that have been taking this drug for five or 10 years. So we don't know what the very long, long-term mm. effects might be. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, it's definitely effective. You know, the average weight loss in a semaglutide trial is about 15% of body weight. So that's 30 pounds in a 200 pound individual. That's, I could use that. I could do that. It's yeah. definitely clinically meaningful. It will dramatically reduce somebody's risk of comorbidities. And, you know, I, I hate to say it, but we've been banging this drum about people improving their lifestyles and eating better and this kind of thing for decades. And the only thing that we've seen change is that obesity rates have gone up. Oh, yeah. And obesity rates have been trending upwards since the 70s. They're now going up exponentially. Yeah. So, I, so Nick, it's, a, it's an extraordinary phenomenon. And it could yeah. be just that the food industry has figured out how to make tasty, salty, fatty, uh, 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 calorie-dense foods that don't cost much money. And push them all day, every day, yeah. on every media outlet you can find. So here we go, Nick. Let's flip this. If you've got somebody who is not clinically obese and is pretty good body weight for their size and all the rest of it, and you give them uh, a semaglutide drug, the weight loss becomes a problem. Doesn't then it push other need for calories and the kind of the the addiction thing doesn't work as well? Does that happen? No, if they weren't overeating to begin with, they they weren't going through this dopamine cycle. Right. Uh, Right. Am Am I right, Nick? Well, everyone everyone has reward related behavior, particularly when it comes to food. Most people do. But if you don't, they, yeah, it, or scotch, or alcohol, or, or psychoactive <laughs> drugs, or gambling, or social media. Everyone has. Everyone is constantly pushing that dopamine button in one way or another, and it just so happens that people who are very overweight seem to do it more often than not with food. But everyone, you know, uh, if you didn't have any dopamine response, you'd, you'd have to be a robot essentially. But um, but anybody could could potentially take these drugs and lose more weight. And this is what you know Neil said at the beginning that he knows you know you know celebrities and things who are, mm. who have been taking Ozempic. And I don't know if you saw the Academy Awards this year. I didn't watch the whole thing, but uh, Kimmel was the was the presenter. And in in his opening he monologue, he joked about it. He said, you know, I look around and I see all these slim, beautiful people, and I can't help but wonder, is Ozempic for me? And uh, you know, it got a good laugh. That is a good but joke. actually. Cut, cut a little bit close to the bone because a lot of people who can afford to pay one thousand, two thousand dollars a month are using the drug when they don't actually necessarily well, need well, it. I have a friend who's on it and uh, he swears by it. And I said to him, "But when you stop taking it, you're going to be fat again." And he was like, "And so I just won't stop taking it." Right. And <laughs> this is the other thing. And there's, I mean, they've done some really, really good studies. There was the Step Four study, which was published. 2021 in the journal of in JAMA, Journal of the American Medical Association. And it was a really nicely executed study. They got a group of like 800 obese individuals and they put them all on semaglutide. They titrated up the dose for the first 20 weeks. So they started very, very low dose. Mm. And every week they increased the, the dosage until it was about 2.4 milligrams per week, which is the recommended dose. And in the first 20 weeks, everybody lost weight. And I think the average weight loss was about 10% of body mass, which is pretty good for 20 weeks work. They then split the group in half. Half the group continued on semaglutide for the rest of the trial for an, for an extra year. The other group got placebo injections, right? Ooh. And you, you can probably guess what happened. The group that continued on semaglutide continued to lose weight. And I think the average weight loss by the end of the trial was between 15 and 20% body mass. The group on placebo regained pretty much all of the weight that they originally lost. But here's the kicker. Everyone in that study was receiving help with their diet, they were, were receiving lifestyle coaching, and they were receiving monthly sessions with a with a psychotherapist to help them with the you know with the psychology of appetite suppression. So Which even shows though that the they psychotherapy were getting, is, eru- is is it's probably it's not working. It's not Something working. in that trial wasn't working. <laughs> but mm-hmm. exactly as Chuck says, if somebody starts taking this drug, you, we better hope that there are no long term side effects mm. because people are going to have to take it for the rest of their lives if they want to retain their weight loss. Where do we stand ethically with 
type 2 diabetes sufferers now being forced to wait for this drug that could be so beneficial for them because it's become the drug of choice for lots and lots of other people that for vanity. They don't have. For some people, not yeah. to take them out of morbid obese states, but others mm -hmm. just to fit into the clothing that yeah. they didn't fit into you know, a year ago. So is there enough of this to go around and to cover the, the people who really need it to save their life? The short answer is no. So the short answer is that the, that the supply at the moment cannot meet the demand. And this is largely because, you know, it's been endorsed by a number of, of celebrities and, you know, and other types of famous people. It's trending on TikTok. A lot of uh, fitness influencers are using it to, you know, help facilitate these dramatic body transformations. And whereas physicians are only supposed to be prescribing these things to, to patients, essentially, people who are clinically obese, so if they have body mass index more than 30, or people with a BMI of 27 or more, who have an additional risk factor, right? Or somebody who's pre-diabetic or diabetic. These are all diagnosable conditions based on clinical criteria, but you, you can't stop a, a physician from prescribing it to somebody else who might ask for it. You can't stop people from getting it online, buying it overseas, buying it from friends. There is a way to get hold of this stuff. And as a result, as I said, supply cannot meet demand. And this, this kind of real implications for a diabetic who has become dependent on Ozempic. Yeah. Now there are there are other options for type two diabetes, uh, type two diabetics, and you know metformin, for example, for the longest time was the, the was the go to treatment, mm. and you can of course inject with insulin. But uh, but GLP one agonists, have, in terms of controlling blood sugar, are just as good, if not better, than insulin. And so if somebody's been used to taking Ozempic every single week, once a week, and then you ask them to switch to insulin because there isn't enough Ozempic to go around. There's a lot of trial. I don't know if you know somebody who's got type 2 diabetes or if you've, you know, but mm. there's a lot of trial and error that goes with the administration of, of insulin. Yeah. You've got to figure out how much to use, when to inject it, to track your blood glucose concentration. Well, we've seen the ads where they have that sort of readable patch on their shoulder. Right. Right. And I'm thinking, wow, you got to monitor it every time before you eat, after you eat, in between yeah. meals, uh, and what happens after you have the banana, before you eat. And so, yeah, this is clearly yeah. a major so how, investment. How, how soon before this market space becomes crowded with GLP-1 drugs that will be for addiction, for and dementia? And do we need more demon monster to, to do this? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and can we use monitor lizards instead? <laughs> Good question. We, we definitely more of something. I mean, the, the, a lot of these synthetic forms are now, they are going to flood the market. You know, semaglutide is, is, is obviously highly sought after. There are a bunch of other GLP-1 agonists uh, that are in development. There's a there's one actually, tizepatide, which is in, it's just finished phase three clinical trials. It will be approved by the FDA probably before the end of the year. And this is a dual action GLP-1 GIP agonist. So it's, I won't bother going into the mechanisms of GIP just for brevity, but it, it, uh, they're basically synergistic together and it's even more effective than semaglutide. So semaglutide in the 18 month clinical trials, average weight loss 15%, tizepatide average weight loss 20% or possibly even more. Wow. So, and so this is just the beginning of, of GLP-1 receptor agonists. Yeah. Um, I think we're a long way off prescribing it for anything like addiction or uh, you know, any of these, these other if indications. If you know it affects the brain in mm. the hypoth hypothalamus or the hippocampus. Right. The hypothalamus. The hypothalamus, yeah. Hypothalamus. You know, I was the big man on the hippocampus, you know. Oh, my like, God. Hey. <laughs> no. leave, the, leave the funnies to Charles. Nice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, so it's, it's, too, it it's too early in the, the hypothalamus then that has nothing to do really with whether it's food or drugs or, or, you know, alcohol or alcohol, social right? Social right? media, there, right. It's yeah. just, there be all it, sorts it of disrupts addictions. the reward system. Yeah. And that seems to be fundamental to so much of what can derail someone's life. Wow. Shit. Yeah. And you're absolutely right. The implications of that could be huge, but at the moment, as I said, this is only being studied experimentally in, in mice and rats. And so we don't know the safety profile of administering in, in those kinds of doses. We don't know exactly what dose would be needed to treat addiction um, I, I, in the long I have term. A, I have a lab rat question. So they, you know, an old mouse is three years old, right? So if they go through multiple generations, or rather, um, what am I trying to say? You, they're animals that don't live as long as we do. So aren't you allowed to scale the long-term effects into their short lifetime to get a sense of it? what the long-term effects might be in us, at least get a first hint at it. 
you can definitely get a hint at it. But but one thing that that uh, scientists and physicians uh, warn against is giving somebody a small dose over ten year period. It, it doesn't necessarily induce the same results as giving somebody a high dose over a very short period. It doesn't always scale very, very well. Okay. So we, we, mm. we, can't, we can't wait to get these data in real time because then we'd have to wait five and 10 Gotta years. Wait 10 years. And, and people are going to you know, be, become very unwell in that time. Everybody notice he lives. said these data because data are plural. It's, it's a plural noun. Mm-hmm. And if a singular data is a datum, just so you know. Ooh. Ooh. Uh, boy. All right. So here, Nick, thinking about this, there is going to have to be off-label legislation, right? And the control thereof of prescription of off-label drugs. But who wins? The clinical innovation or the legislation? Because if you if you just crush innovation within a clinical environment, what's an incentive to go forward if you're still waiting that a period of time? Yeah, this is a very uh, hotly contested and highly divisive issue because on the one hand, you've got You've got scientists and physicians who very much feel that that the FDA, for example, so the FDA uh, are the regulatory body for all of the new drugs that that, com- that come onto the market, and the FDA are the gatekeepers for which drugs can be promoted commercially by pharmaceutical companies. And some people think that they are overly bureaucratic, and that in doing so, they prevent drugs or delay drugs getting on the market that could be helping people. Right. So that's that's kind of and and these people will always put forward these you know hundreds of examples where patients are waiting for drugs to get approval and they need these drugs and then the drugs are finally approved but it comes too late for these of course it's the entire theme wrong. of the Dallas Buyers Club uh, as oh as yeah a, that's right as the storyline and of course uh, and there was emergency some there's some regulatory emergency bypass that was enabled for COVID vaccines. Is that correct? Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so they were, so the, the actual approval process was expedited. We yeah. should, you know, hasten to add that these the MRNA vaccines, for example, have been in development for, yes, of course. for a de- decade or yeah, so, decade, yeah. but yes. the actual approval process was expedited for that very reason, because, you know, mm. hundreds of thousands of millions of people around the world were dying already. So you can't wait two or three years that you would do for the normal process. And right. it obviously turned out to be the right choice. But at the other end of the extreme, you have people arguing the opposite, that the FDA, are they need to be more bureaucratic. They, they need to be more conservative uh, because history is littered with, with instances where the FDA were premature to approve a drug that then turned out to have really nasty side effects. Okay, I like, hear less um, of that than the other, but I, I believe you that they're out there. That they wanted yeah. to be even more conservative. Fen Fen, yes, Fen Fen's a great example. So, yeah. so it was you know the 1930s, 40s, 50s. A bit, the main drug that we used to treat obesity, the royal we, of course, was amphetamine, because amphetamine is a very powerful stimulant, as you know. It increases metabolic rate, increases sympathetic drive, helps people burn more calories, which is great. It was moderately successful at helping people lose weight. But it was obviously highly addictive because amphetamine is is addictive and it caused all sorts of heart problems and heart complications. Then fentamine was approved in the late 1960s, I think. And fentamine is is a a, a less powerful stimulant, but it still kind of exerts stimulant-like effects. And again, it was moderately successful at helping people to lose weight by working as an appetite suppressant. Uh, Fluoramine was was approved um, shortly after that. And then some bright spark thought, thought to themselves, well, if we combine, combine these two, the two drugs together, yeah. we get an even more potent effect. The, the thing was um, featured, uh, they, they eventually did approve it as Redux, which was, a, which was featured on the cover of Time magazine. There were 18 million prescriptions for the drug the following year. 100 Americans died because of heart problems. And 20% of the people who received a prescription for Fenfen or Redux had to have heart surgery to correct damaged heart wow. valves. Mm, mm. So that's an example of not only was a drug that was being prescribed off label when it shouldn't have been, but the FDA being under so much pressure to try and tackle this growing you know, obesity epidemic or this in- increases in population body weight that they sort of jumped the gun on the safety profile. So understandably often, now- How often do you hear about Americans having to go to Mexico or to France to get a drug right. that's not yet approved by the FDA. Right. We, we hear that a lot. But on the, yeah, the other side of that uh, may even be worse in the, in, the, in the full spectrum of public health. What's the percentage, Nick, of off-label drugs in terms of doctor's prescription? 
So, so just for the listeners who aren't sure, off-label means it's a drug that has been FDA approved, but then a physician has decided to to write a prescription uh, to, for something to some, else to, to, for for some other indication or in a different dose or in a population for which it hasn't already been approved. Okay, right. and the it's probably about between twenty and thirty percent of all prescriptions are for off-label drugs. So it's very common. It is not illegal. It's uh, widely practiced in the states and around the world. Um, but I think it probably needs some better regulation because the FDA, of course, they regulate the availability of new drugs. They don't regulate medical practice. So the FDA are very much hands off when it comes to off label. So ivermectin can be prescribed for COVID even though it's an antiparasitic. Right. And it, exactly. So, so the general criteria for the, or the recommendations for a physician to prescribe off label, they, the drug has to be supported by scientific evidence and or sound scientific evidence, the physician has to lean heavily on their medical experience. And of course, the third thing goes without saying that the physician has to have the the, the patient's best interests at heart. The problem with that is- it's, first, it's, do it's, no harm. That's what yes. that is. Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. First, do no harm. A prima non nocera. Uh, but the problem with that is that what I consider to be sound scientific evidence might be very, very different to what somebody else considers to be sound scientific scientific evidence. And if, if a physician leans heavily on their medical experience, well, what if they don't have much experience? What if they, their experience pales into comparison, you know, relative to their, uh, you know, somebody- That's what uh, the internet is for, so they can put up a YouTube video. We've seen Right, it. exactly. You can just go and watch YouTube. <laughs> exactly. We know, for example, on the ivermectin case, you know, I read a study that was published earlier this year that found that conservative physicians were more likely to prescribe ivermectin and hydro hydroxychloroquine for treating COVID-19. And the, the main driver for that was cable news. Cable news. Yep. Right. There it is. You know, it's, it's, I will say this, stuff. though. I took ivermectin when I had COVID, and my uh, my intestinal worms were cured. No, COVID. Thank Thank you, cured them straight away. COVID. <laughs> I, I still kept the worms. They just yeah. didn't have COVID. And you still Downstream live in the stable with, with, with the other horses. And I still live. <laughs> yeah. That's so, I, I can't stop eating hay now. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, Nick, we got to end it. We got we to gotta land this plane. Land. Uh, Nick, this has been a delight to have you on yet a second time. Yeah. I know it's not going to be our last time because you are a trove of information and you can hear how curious we are. You yeah. know how curious our, our fan base would be as well. So thanks for uh, this second appearance on Star Talk. Thank you. It's been great to see you guys again. So uh, thanks for having me. All right, uh, Chuck and, and Gary. Always a pleasure. All right, Pleasure, guys. Neil. All right, Thank this you, has Nick. been Neil deGrasse Tyson special edition. This one on quick fixes, real or not. Until next time, keep looking up. <laughs>